stuff. Now, please welcome to the stage the director of Anonymous, Roland Emmerich. <laughs> its star, Risa Vans, and its writer, John Orloff. Now, gentlemen, especially in England, this is quite the incendiary claim you're making. Can you talk about where you first heard this theory, this this anti-Stratfordian theory, I guess, that uh, Shakespeare didn't write his own plays? Uh, it's all actually his fault, because <laughs> he uh, gave me a script to read, uh, which uh, was actually his first script, right? Yeah. And he wrote it uh, roughly like 15, 16 years ago, and mm -hmm. I... I saw it roughly 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and I was just super fascinated by the whole story and, uh, and what it means, and, mm -hmm. uh, and from immediately decided this uh, is a film for me. And uh, we started together then working on it, which took mm -hmm. us another like three, four years. Okay, why, why did it take so long? Was there a lot of research, a lot of delving well, the, in? Most of the research had already been done when I wrote the original draft. But, but what, when Roland and I started to collaborate on the script and to mold it into the movie that it eventually became, um, it's a very complicated structure with a lot of flashbacks and flash forwards. And, and we would say it, it has a lot of moving parts, you know, a lot of characters. It's an ensemble piece. It's, it's very, if I may say so, it's sort of a Shakespearean drama. And that means a lot of characters with a lot of competing agendas. And that's a very complicated thing to orchestrate mm. all those working parts properly. Mm. So that took about, I think, 20 drafts, I think, but, but before we were done. Okay. And where did you first uh, hear this theory? Uh, I first learned of the Shakespeare authorship question uh, when I was in my early 20s, uh, right out of college. Uh, there was, uh, in America, uh, there's a, a thing called the PBS, the Public Broadcasting System. And they had a special on it, a front line. Uh, and I'd never heard of it before. And um, it instantly piqued my interest. And I started to do m more research. And the more research I did, the more fascinated I became by the subject uh, and figured I had to write a movie about it. <laughs> and uh, Reese, as an actor, uh, are you a bit of a believer in this theory? Do you well, subscribe I mean, to it? Uh, as, as, as an actor, um, Previous to be to, to being offered this job, I, I was kind of um, aware of the authorship debate. Mm. But um, you know, my job as an actor was to was to research or you know become accustomed with with the, the, the character that I was playing, which is Edward de Vere. Mm. And there's a a huge, vast, rich body of evidence, uh, and and. and it, it's there, you know, from his childhood to his life in court to his travels. Um, magnificent story which um, would stand up on its own two feet. And, and if you apply this guy's uh, presence in that time and his relationship to the Queen and his travels and his uh, education, um, it's very compelling <laughs> compared to um, the... Strat if I was a lawyer... <laughs> Okay. I would go for Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. The evidence is there. Do you think, is this a theory that's gaining ground uh, amongst the acting community? I mean, Derek Jacobi's in this film. He's a proponent of this theory. Uh, Orson Welles, I believe, was as well. Mark Rylance as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Sorry, gentleman, yeah, uh, Mark Rylance, who was the artistic director of The Globe for 10 years, doesn't think the man from Stratford wrote a word. Wow, okay. and, and it is, this particular theory has been gaining ground. It's a late theory. It only was sort of first proposed in the 1920s. And for a good 60 years, not much happened with it. Mm. And then an American in the 1980s got obsessed with it and wrote a, a sort of the seminal book on the subject called The Mysterious William Shakespeare by a, a man named Charlton Ogburn. And that started a whole sort of reevaluation of Oxford and, and truly, uh, even in the time period from when I had originally, originally written this script, around 1998, to when Roland read the script four or five years later, just in that five years, there was so much new research that had been done that Roland wanted to put in some of these new facts or, or theories that had been discovered just in those five years into the script. So it's, it's definitely something that's gaining more and more momentum as time goes on. Mm. Obviously, we don't want to give away too much. The, these 
these facts and uh, why you think that it might have been the Earl of Oxford. But can you talk about why you chose the Earl of Oxford for the film? Because there are a number of theories that if Shakespeare didn't write his plays, it might have been Francis Bacon, it might have been Christopher Marlowe. Why, why the Earl of Oxford? I, I think for me, <laughs> um, <laughs> Oxford's life uh, seems to be the most mirrored in the plays themselves. Um, and it just from a purely from me reading uh, and doing the research, he seems the likeliest candidate. But, but above and beyond that, dramatically, he's the most interesting candidate. Because when one does the research and learns the biography of, of Mr. De Vere, as, as Reese was just saying, Hamlet suddenly seems to be an autobiography. And just from a dramatist, that starts to get very, very interesting. And Reese as an actor, how did you find him? Who is, who is Edward for you? Well, for me, Edward de Vere is the author of these complete works because they, are, they are, are at once enable him to um, sub subvert and politicize and mobilize a mob mm. for an injustice that he feels that has been done to him. And at the same time, they become love letters to a queen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sorry. Yeah. So I, 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 what, what, what I think it's, in, it, it's important, just, just to get it out of the way now as, yeah. we, start, as we start on this press junket in London, because it's, <laughs> it's going to be contentious and it's going to be incendiary and it's going to be exciting. Yeah. But just to put the Stratfordians to bed, I am not an, Ox <laughs> I am not an Oxfordian, okay. but to put the Stratfordians to bed, yeah. you, I will say this now, and I'm just a mere actor, <laughs> as Shakespeare was. I am not an academic. Right. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. There is, you, there is very little evidence to support that William Shakespeare of Stratford penned this magnificent body of work. Mm -hmm. There is very little documentation of his life as a human being, as someone who operated in Elizabethan society to support that. Mm -hmm. There is a huge body of evidence to support the fact that the that Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, may have penned these life, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. may have penned these works. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So we need to look at this. Uh, th this is the glory of Shakespeare. This is what it enables us to do. Yeah, yes. is to question why these we not when or why these pl plays were were written, and, I, and please back me up, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 just, I just feel like a dancing girl here. <laughs> a bearded but dancing girl. I, I, really, I, I, I have been, I've been empowered by the, you know, and, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm not, I really have, you know, and, and, I, and I think, I think uh, William Shakespeare of Stratford has become a brand. Mm. Yeah. And the Stratfordian theory is flimsy. It makes it look like some cheap, <laughs> Taiwan jeans. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interesting word you used as well, Reese. You said may. And Roland, this, this movie comes down pretty conclusively on the side of Oxford wrote these plays. Can you talk about the decision to do that? And well, it, it had to. It had yeah. to. You cannot say, you know, uh, uh, what we are saying without, like, put your bets on somebody. But I, mm -hmm. I agree with uh, Reese. You know, I think uh, the Earl of Oxford is the most interesting and the yeah. most... Uh, uh, it's always this, this discussion was... Uh, uh, but always going, how learned do you have to be to create great art? And I think you have to be uh, really uh, learned. You yeah. cannot, you know, uh, pure genius will never ever like kind of explain this. Mm -hmm. And uh, even, you know, when you look at other geniuses, when uh, if Mozart would have not played, you know, like six, seven, eight hours a day as a kid and as a teenager, uh, like kind of piano, he could have not written what he wrote later in his life. Yeah. And, and let, let, uh, let's, oh, yeah. I was going to say, let's remember if, if Stratford indeed was the true author, he does nothing until Venus and Adonis is published. That's his first piece of work. So where did he learn to become a poet before Venus and Adonis? Or did <laughs> it just spring out of pure genius? But the evidence that may not exist or may have been expunged or may have been lost over the years? Well, that's just, very, just, that is the most convenient. Advocate. The interesting <laughs> thing about yeah. Shakespeare is everything's been lost. <laughs> Every letter he ever wrote has been lost. Yeah. Every manuscript he ever wrote has been lost. 
Every poem he ever wrote, wrote has been lost. There is not one single piece of paper ever that has been discovered that was actually written by William Shakespeare. Nothing. Someone, someone could be sitting on a treasure trove of papers in their house, <laughs> maybe in the attic somewhere, who knows. But uh, <laughs> one, of, one of the great things about this film is it doesn't just focus on the authorship question mm. or, uh, or Oxford, but it has a wider uh, sc scope as well. And uh, Queen Elizabeth is a major character in this Well, film. you know, uh, we uh, decided to make this movie not actually about the authorship. Yeah. The uh, question we made it about what was really the most important thing in that time, which was succession. And it was the waning years, the last 10 years of, uh, of Queen Elizabeth. And uh, she um, had uh, officially no, uh, no heirs. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, power uh, plays uh, yeah. going on at that time. Absolutely. Uh, I believe we can actually see a clip from the film now in which we, in which we meet Queen Elizabeth, played by Vanessa Redgrave. Can you yes. set this one up, Roland? It's well, it's like another moment, you know, where she gets uh, uh, presented with a play by her f uh, f uh, f uh, favorite courtier uh, uh, poet and playwright, uh, which is called Anonymous. And, uh, and uh, it's actually the first... Uh, uh, how, how like kind of Oxford starts to kind of get back into the game mm. by like sending her this gift. Okay, Let's see the clip, thanks. Fantastic stuff. And um, as we saw, Lyra's got a fantastic cast this, this movie. I mean, uh, Reese obviously, the likes of David Thewlis, Edward Hogg, uh, Rafe Spall, but you've, you've gone for a very interesting decision. You've got Queen Elizabeth I played in two different eras by mother and daughter, Vanessa Redgrave and Jolie Richardson. Can you talk about that? Well, you know, uh, when, when we were wrote the script, you know, uh, and, and uh, invented, you know, that we will go back in time, one of the first uh, things we discussed, uh, uh, John and I, how, how can, you, can you cast that? Mm. And, uh, and I said uh, then, you know, uh, because I worked with uh, Julie Richardson, the Patriot, before, uh, I think, you know, uh, I will go for uh, Julie Richardson and her mother, Vanessa, because yeah. they're, they're in a way not... Uh, uh, maybe look alike or, or, or look a little bit alike, but they're very kind of uh, similar uh, characters, uh, people. And yeah, because she, uh, they're like kind of related. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's, uh, for me, it's always not uh, the, how, how close somebody looks, it's more how, um, you know, how, a char how the character is related. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we went to London and I've, I asked them if they, are in the film and they said both yes, which was actually <laughs> the first action we had uh, because we wanted to make that sure that. And then what I also like uh, uh, said uh, to uh, Sony Pictures at the very beginning, I want to have an all English cast. Yeah. Because it was very important for me to make this uh, film uh, how I wanted to make it as, uh, as true um, uh, to, to English history as possible. Well, Reese, of course, you're Welsh, but yeah. <laughs> but, but, but deeply affected by English history. <laughs> it is a fantastic cast. As you know, yeah. as an Irishman. Yeah. Absolutely, you know. Yeah. The action is there. Um, what's it like as, a, as an actor, though, when you, you go to a scene and you're playing opposite Vanessa Redgrave? It must be like playing chess with a grandmaster. No, it isn't. It's, 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 like, being, um, it's like being embraced and <laughs> bed bathed by an angel. <laughs> Actually, um, no, it, it, it's, uh, it, uh, I, I, I think, you know, to, to reluctantly use the word British, but I, but I, but I think uh, uh, British actors, you, you, we, 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 you know, the, the words of Shakespeare and the works of Shakespeare are, are, are kind of embedded in us. It's, it's, it's genetic mm. and, and consequently our... Um, our theatrical protocol as a consequence of that is embedded in us and 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 that's uh, the, the foundations for a great ensemble mm. and 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 that's what i felt that's what roland as assembled here mm. was it was a great ensemble with the 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 manners and the um and the protocol of an ensemble an yeah. ensemble which, which which is which is particularly british i think you know, um, so I, I, I felt at once in, in, in the presence of uh, um, acting royalty in yeah. Vanessa's case, but yeah. also I was, I, I was as humbled by uh, actors, young actors I'd never worked with before.
mm. and 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 that was um, that was the dance that mm. we've created, and I think that um, Elizabethan universe is is perfect because of his casting oh, yeah. and his writing, and I and when you see it, it'll rock you. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like filming the scenes uh, in the theater, the theater going scenes? Because they're they're absolutely fantastic. When you see the film, uh, Roland has created a, a very authentic depiction of what theater going was like at the time, where the crowd really got involved in plays. And as an actor and as a director, that must have been an incredible buzz uh, making those scenes happen. Well, it was uh, very important for us to show uh, how uh, these plays were performed in their time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we show them. Uh, on, at court, you know, mm -hmm. which is a relatively stiff affair. Uh, and then the liveliness of the public theater, which uh, at that time, you know, were pretty much invented. Yeah. Uh, around that time, everywhere, like, you know, these uh, theaters uh, cropped up and, uh, and we, uh, uh, we, we built one of them uh, in full size. Mm -hmm. And uh, we filled it with people and we got some of the best actors uh, the English stage has to offer, like a Mark Rylands. Mm. You know, to to play on on it, and it was a it was a it had very much the the feel of a theater. Mm. You know, when when you when when people visit our sets, you know, we, because the first part of uh, every play, we first you know did the wide shots, we, so we hit the cameras, and it felt really like you were in a in a in a in a play of the in that time, we, and uh, and you couldn't see really the the, the technology, and uh, it was sometimes magical. There mm. was like this moment when first time uh, Mark Rylance come on stage and uh, and did prologue, uh, it was ma just magical. <laughs> May I add something? There's this, this great moment. Um, it happened several times, uh, but particularly when we were doing the St. Crispin's Day speech in, in Henry V. Now, you have to remember, we would have six or seven hundred extras, but they're German because we shot <laughs> in Germany. And very few of them spoke English. And as our actor was doing the St. Crispin's Day speech, there's a moment where he sort of leans down into the crowd as he's coming to the climax of the speech and he touches just one person and suddenly 300 people go like this to touch him. It was unbelievable, it was unscripted, unstaged, but the power of the words and the power of the acting, even though they didn't understand what he was saying, they just wanted to touch it and be a part of it. It was unbelievable. It's fantastic. And uh, Reese, as an actor, is that something you'd like to see happen next time you're on stage? Well, you're not, not now, obviously, but you know. <laughs> well, no, maybe no, yeah. It's just, like, <laughs> just get together. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, I, 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 in watching the film, the, doing the film was uh, a different thing because I, I was totally immersed in, 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 you know, an aristocrat's tights and rough. <laughs> but in watching the film, what, 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 what I came away from watching the film was how, how powerful and how, and, and how uh, potent the, the, the spoken word would have been at that time. Mm. And, and in the same way, the, 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 there's kind of a, you know, a symmetry and a high irony to what we're doing now. You know, I don't know how many of you guys are, are online you know, and, and, and are pushing this through as we speak. You probably are. You know what I mean. This, this, <laughs> this, this, this is this is what w uh, this is what would have been happening in the globe and in the Swan at the time. This is why these places were burnt to the ground time and time again. They were dangerous. They were like a, 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 a platform for the people for ideas. That, you know who that they were operating um, in and around a defunct. Uh, autocratic government and, and, and a lazy church. Mm. I've said it before in, in other interviews, and this may, may seem shallow, but as an, you know, this film does for the spoken word and for live theater. Shakespeare should never be read or studied. It should be spoken, spoken and performed. Mm. And, and, and for a movie to, to, for us to, to, to enable us to discover the magic of the spoken word, the spell mm. of the word, the abracadabra <laughs> of our own voices is extraordinary. Because that transforms and that's Shakespeare, what brings it? down governments. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's true, because uh, one, one of the reasons that the movie says that uh, Edward wasn't able to publish the plays under his own name is because of this idea that plays were heretical at the time. Uh, and that as, a, as an earl, he wasn't able to publish his plays. He would, be, he would have been disgraced had he done so. And I think we've got a clip coming up in which that which slightly addresses that with Ben Johnson. Yeah. yeah. If you can sit, yeah. Should I uh, yeah, announce the next clip? Yeah. Uh, then the, this clip is uh, uh, the Earl of Oxford uh, actually wanted uh, another writer. He saw a play performed uh, like Ben Johnson to be his beard. But uh, Ben Johnson... Uh, chose, you know, his friend, the actor William Shakespeare. And uh, this is a scene now where, you know, um, you know, which is after it's revealed that William Shakespeare is like uh, the, the nom de plume, you know, of uh, his work. Yeah. Okay. There's a really interesting notion there that uh, Edward had stockpiled these plays. He'd been writing them for years. He's possessed by the desire to write. Uh, John, where did that come from? Well, uh, the Oxfordian theory is, is one that would suggest that uh, these plays were originally written, or, or certainly a large portion of them were originally written for court performances only. Uh, and uh, later on, he released them by the, when he saw these new theaters go up and he was excited by the opportunity to show them to six or seven or 10,000 people. Uh, and so in our movie, uh, he sort of takes these plays that he's been working on all of his life and gives them off to uh, uh, Ben Johnson to have them performed uh, now or, or in 1600 or so. Okay. So that's the, the, where the notion comes from. For example, you know, um, when you start to get into the history of all of this stuff, Hamlet is often dated to 1602. Uh, that's the traditional time of when Hamlet was written. Uh, however, there's records of a play called Hamlet, without an author's name on it, but in 1596 a play called Hamlet is mentioned, in 1594 a play called Hamlet is mentioned, and in 1589 a play called Hamlet is mentioned. So the idea being that these are much older plays mm -hmm. than we think they were, and, and uh, the Earl of Oxford is uh, 16 years older than Shakespeare. So he would have written these plays much earlier. And uh, you obviously did a lot of research for this movie as well, but uh, you have a two-hour movie, you've got a lot of history to fit in. Did you sometimes find yourself maybe finessing dates and, and whatnot? And just, just as William Shakespeare did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he did. That, that is a, it is a tradition in historical dramas to uh, change timelines or actually really compress timelines. Mm -hmm. Like Shakespeare, often there are characters that are dead that appear in Shakespeare's plays. We do the same. I'm, I can, can say that, Philip Mar uh, that uh, Christopher Marlowe was not alive in the events in our film. He died two years earlier than our <laughs> film, but he is happily in our film. Um, so yes, you need to do things. The other big one we do is, uh, as I'm sure you all know, or many of you know, Richard II was performed on the eve of the Essex Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Well, Roland and I had many conversations about uh, using Richard II in our Essex Rebellion, but we were stuck with this idea that it's a very complicated play to explain the political relevance mm -hmm. that the metaphors in Richard II were pertaining to. So rather than using Richard II, we chose to use Richard III mm -hmm. because it was a very easy thing for our audience to realize that Richard III had political significance to an audience in 1600 for the simple fact that Richard III, as we all know, has a hunchback in Shakespeare's play. Not historically accurate, by the way, but hunchback he has. And indeed, Robert Cecil, the Queen's chief minister, Elizabeth's queen minister, also historically had a hunchback. So the political metaphors were shorthanded mm. by using Richard III instead of Richard II. Fair enough. Uh, and Roland, as a director of Independence Day, The Day After Tomorrow, and 2012, you're used to world ending, but this, this movie is very much about world building as well. Can you talk about creating this, this, this fantastic Elizabethan era of London that, that, that you have? Well, you know, I had uh, uh, over like 10 years time to think about it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it hit me actually when I was, uh, doing, when I was shooting 2012. Uh, we also uh, shot the whole movie on stage, mm -hmm. pretty much. And, you know, and the, the, 
the film took place all over the world. Yeah. And this was the first time I worked with a digital camera and it all of a sudden hit me that, yeah, this is probably the method to do my Shakespeare film. Mm -hmm. And it was one of these rare uh, um, occurrences that actually visual effects or CGI helped us to make the film look bigger, but also make it cheaper. Mm -hmm. Because when you, uh, when you move around you know, Elizabethan houses uh, in England, yeah. uh, you uh, have huge costs in travel and, uh, and living expenses. And here we could you know, relatively fast you know, like kind of exchange uh, uh, sets. And in the morning, we're shooting uh, one house, you know, uh, uh, one background, and then and two hours later, already another one. So right. it, it was a very kind of... Uh, um, efficient way to, to do a movie like that. Also, what it's really helped us to do it as accurate mm. as possible. Because when you, we looked at all the other um, Elizabethan films which were done lately, yeah. and you know, they were not as accurate as our film, because they had to use uh, uh, locations. And you don't get like certain uh, Elizabethan houses at all yeah. because the, the, the National Trust doesn't let you. So what you end up is like with churches because in church, so in for example, the film Elizabeth, you know, Elizabeth lives in a church most of the time, <laughs> which she actually didn't, you know. Yeah. So uh, we could actually make it more accurate mm. because of that, you know, because uh, uh, we, um, I mean, uh, our visual effect people uh, were pretty much, you know, going through England and photographing every uh, Elizabethan house they could get their hand on, uh, and out of that built whole London out mm. of uh, in the computer, and yeah. it's uh, pretty amazing when you can all of a sudden do wide shots, oh, they're amazing, you know, yeah. because they're like open up a film. Because uh, uh, London always was for me one of the characters of the film. Yeah, uh, they're fantastic wide shots. Uh, uh, yeah, I uh, gotta say, I just wanna add, I mean, there's helicopter shots. I mean, it's not just wide shots. It's, I, I just want to sell it a little. You're, you're <laughs> underselling your own work, Roland, because it's really quite staggering. I don't, uh, want, to, I don't want to brag. Really. I have, uh, well, I'll I, brag on your behalf. Uh, I, I've I, never seen a period movie like this. I mean, the, the sense of London, uh, it, the recreation is just spectacular, and, and the scope of the uh, recreation is, is truly like nothing that's ever been made before. Were you tempted at all to destroy Elizabeth in London? Was that... Was that well, we're like <laughs> burned temptation. down the Rose Theater. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but it's, uh, it, it was uh, very interesting for the people I normally work with who normally have to build it first and then destroy it. For them, it was, you know, they, they loved to kind of build something which yeah. uh, nobody has ever seen, you know, yeah. and they were really, really into it. Fantastic. Shall we meet William Shakespeare? William Shakespeare. No, um, <laughs> this final clip introduces Rafe Spall, who uh, plays William Shakespeare, if you want to. Talk about it, Roland. Well, it's uh, it's uh, it's after the scene we saw uh, before. You know, uh, he is an actor, and he yeah. like uh, reads the manuscript for um, you know the play of Romeo and Juliet, and he wants to play it. And that's the scene. He wants to play Romeo. Yeah, he wants to play Romeo. Okay, roll the clip. Love, uh, every actor wants to play. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's a very interesting comedic take on William Shakespeare. Can you talk about that decision? Oh, I Roland guess that's me. <laughs> Roland or John. Well, um, you know, when, when Roland and I started to reimagine my original script into what, what the movie is now, we really had a long conversation about making uh, a Shakespearean drama in the full sense of what that means, both uh, thematically as well as, you know, having a larger group of characters and and all the sort of rules that you have in an in a, in Elizabethan drama, and one naturally needs the fool. <laughs> and so we, we chose Shakespeare as our fool. Now, many might be very upset by that idea, but we have to remember that uh, not only do we know very little about Shakespeare the man, we certainly know nothing about what kind of man he was personality-wise. So this is our sort of version of, of the man. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, okay, guys, if you have uh, any questions at all for Reese and John and Roland, put your hands up. We have some roving microphones, and we'll get around to you guys in due course. There's a gentleman over here, okay. and then front row. Okay. Uh, this question for Roland. Just wondering, because Anonymous is a, a very different film to what you've done in the past, does this mark a point in your career where you're looking to do something 
more dramatic, or are you going to go like back to blowing up Paris next time round? Is there a, <laughs> a, a you looking to do something new uh, in the future? Well, not Paris. I like Paris too much. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's uh, my next film will be a science fiction film again, more in the vein of my other films. Um, but uh, I hope that uh, I can do once in a while, in between my big movies, a movie like Anonymous, because in a in a way, it reconnects me to my craft, you know. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just one of these things where uh, it was just a time which I want to have again. It was like probably like the most amazing time I had ever on a movie set. And so I want, you know, I got a little, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm now addicted to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and, and, and because of that, you know, I hope that I can do more of this kind of movies. Of course, for a lot of directors, this is a big movie. <laughs> this is well, it was, for you, uh, it's just I mean, uh, it, it, was, uh, it, it was, in essence, you know, uh, in cash, $25 million. Okay, wow. Uh, which is really an uh, amazing price for a movie like that. The movie cost uh, uh, 30, a little bit more, more than $30 million, mm -hmm. but we have now, um, like you guys have in, uh, in England, a tax rebate system, yeah. and uh, because of that, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the movie was o only like $25 million because we got $5 million back from the taxes. Fantastic. Uh, gentleman in the uh, front row here. Only $25 million. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's... It's cheap watch, for a movie these days, watch, yes. Watch yeah. the movie. Um, I, have a, I have a question for Roland, but uh, first of all, I hope, I hope this movie brings back not only the magic of live theater, but the interest in Shakespeare that we all hope it will. Um, I read last week that Sony cut the release about 80% of mm -hmm. theaters in America. What are your feelings on that? Uh, actually, it was, I'm, I'm very happy about it because when we like, kind of talked about it at the very beginning, I was always a little bit uh, confused. You know? Normally, these movies have to build an audience. They're not you know, uh, uh, you know, like what you kind of uh, uh, get out there in, uh, in big numbers. You know? uh, this has to build, you know? and now it has... Uh, the kind of release that it can build, you know, and uh, they were not cutting back on the advertisement. Uh, they do the same advertisement, but for like uh, much lesser prints. And we hope that naturally uh, the movie catches on. Uh, we know that the movie will catch on, so and, and because of that, we reduce the prints. Thank you. Is there talk or hope that it might be a contender for awards come January, February, with a small platform release like this going wider? And that seems to be the uh, the hope. Well, he kind of deserves uh, nomination, <laughs> yeah. that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> I'd like to thank <laughs> Yeah, get some practice in now. Uh, we have time for one more question. So, uh, oh, Lady Wright, how did you do that? Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Sit um, by magic. Given the current renaissance of 3D, I was wondering, um, this is a question for Roland, really. Um, do you think you'll be making your next film in 3D? Uh, and what are your thoughts about 3D? Um, I am um, not a fan of 3D. Uh, and I'm very uh, fortunate that I don't have to shoot my next movie in 3D. <laughs> uh, because um, I think 3D only adds very rarely something to a film. There are films where it adds something. Uh, I thought, you know, Alice in Wonderland was a movie like that. I thought mm -hmm. uh, uh, Avatar was a movie like that. Uh, but uh, there is a a number of films which shouldn't be shot in 3D. And, uh, and I, m me personally, I rather see the 2D versions of films, uh, even when, uh, and, and luckily there's always both available. And uh, Reese is uh, someone who's been on the, uh, the right side of the camera for both 2D and 3D films. What's your feelings on the subject? Well, I, you know, I, um, what I love about 3D is what, uh, is it enables a director to, um, to paint to pr present us with uh, a, a symmetry that we have a primal understanding of you know like peter greenaway in mm. in 3d would be a disaster <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> would be horrendous <laughs> um if you want 3d go to the theater <laughs> <laughs> and be embraced by people it's, but it's, in it's, some yeah. cases of course it's dynamic and it's beautiful yeah. it, and, works and very, it works very well for like kind of documentaries you know or for concert films yeah. because when you see a concert in mm. 3d it's like you're going to a concert or like uh, wim wenders did the pina bausch film 
yeah. uh, which oh, is yeah, in yeah. 3D, uh, which is about dancing, and there, like, kind of the room and the and space really makes a lot of sense. Uh. I mean, all, all, all I can say is my, my only experience of 3D is it, 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 Spider-Man. Yeah. And um, you, you associate uh, 3D with a um, geographical or a architect architectural kind of vertigo. Yeah. But when, when it's applied emotionally, yeah. it's, um, it's super penetrative, you know, and, um, and I think it's applied that way in Spider-Man. But, is it, you, you know, when it... I think... I, I, think, I, I, think, I, I think when it's applied for, forensically, at, uh, as opposed to... Um, um, Gimmick, uh, gimmick? Yeah. wise it's amazing. You know, yeah. if, I mean, what if, you're saying if is you can cool. circle around an eye, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and feel that you're a satellite around <laughs> the human eye, then it works. It I seems like directors. It seems like directors are still figuring out the 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 the, the, the language of 3D, yeah. how to use it emotionally rather than just the shock value or the excitement value. But I think at one point it'll get there. Fantastic. And uh, on that bombshell, that's all we have time for. Um, thanks, guys, for coming. The film's out on Friday. Thanks to Sony and Apple. And, of course, John Orloff, Reese fans, and Roland Emmerich.